thing about it too, some people are just, once again, you know, genetically speaking, house uh, body fat in certain areas compared to others. And often it's, it's, it's adipose based, brown fat based as well. So if you reduce one, you often will reduce the other. And this is a great thing. Welcome to the GTA Advisors Podcast. We interview greater Toronto area business owners, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Our goal is to bring greater Toronto area residents the best advice from our community's brightest minds. Now, here's your host, author, entrepreneur, and real estate innovator, Robert Caruso. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the GTA Advisors Podcast. Our special monthly guest, Dwight Nelson, is here from Bodies to Envy. Welcome, Dwight. How are you, Rob? Yeah, excellent, excellent. So uh, we're going to go through a bunch of new topics. Uh, again, people are just uh, flooding your, your inbox, flooding your Facebook page, and, and just asking away all these different questions that people want answers for, especially when it comes to health. It's just the most important thing. You can't live without health, right? <laughs> So, uh, it's, the, it's the world we live in. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> so, uh, no, you no can't have a good life without health, obviously. So, it's, yeah, it's tricky. So, we're going to get into, like I said, a bunch of different topics. So, uh, maybe let's start with um, how has training evolved over the years? And not only just how has it evolved, where is it going? What's the future of, of training? And, uh, and, and what's your view on this? Like, maybe you can shed some light on it. Yeah, most definitely. Um, once again, I got into the field very early. It was in the 80s. When I got into the personal training uh, field, my first course was 1989 at, at Humber. I had taken a PT, uh, I think it was PT, PT Canada, the course was, maybe 15 people in the class. And it was more geared towards aerobic uh, activity, not so much just resistance training. At the time, there was a stereotype that Weight training was more for, for men, and women did aerobics, and that was kind of the pretense of the course at the time. Fast forward into the 90s, and um, clearly we know weights are for everybody. Um, so it's it's gone from this women, you go to the back, and you go to the aerobic room, and men, the weights are all for you. I remember being at Super Fitness, and the women would walk by, and you'd have to walk through the weight floor to get to the aerobic room, and all the girls would walk down with their heads down. Oh. Just a, it's like a... Yeah. dash it was yeah. it was a separation that was really you know as, as at a time it was acceptable but we realized through education that this is totally was was just the wrong route so it's evolved to the point where women children people of the advanced age are, are now taking part in fitness training it's it's something that has become an importance at one time personal training was really also geared towards athletes people who worked out were more athletic based uh, soccer player hockey player uh, bodybuilder. Um, it was more geared towards sports specific training where now it's more of a wellness approach where, you know, we're, we're dealing with obesity issues. We're dealing with medication issues. We're dealing with stress levels that are extremely high and personal training has become something that, okay, I don't have, I don't have time on my hands to go to a gym and just do nothing. I need to be productive. So the service now for this reason has become more available and more cost efficient for the consumer. Because at one time it was a little bit too expensive. Now, mind you, some facilities do charge a fairly high rate personal training. So it's definitely become more of a business as well. You can never have this just good. There has to be an offset with the, with the industry. The profit, uh, profit marketing part of it has definitely increased a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you look around, you have a lot of trainers who are online. Um, they're out there on Google. They're on your social media sites that can come to your home. And, and service you uh, for a fairly good fee. I've seen trainers do home visits in their communities for thirty dollars a session. You know, uh, that's great. That's a great price. Mm -hmm. And this involves you and the trainer in a one-on-one -on -one setting, and and it's in your home. So you now dictate the environment. Where at one time, trainers would only see you at gyms, fitness clubs. There was no real separation. I can't get to a gym. I'm a mother with children at home, and you know, I don't have that much time on my hands. So it's become a lot more diverse. Mm -hmm. Going forward for the future. Uh, I see it becoming more diverse. Uh, mobile trainers are, are definitely a way to go. I'm a studio. It's no longer the big box gym, 30,000 square feet. A lot of smaller facilities are opening up, and they're catering to people in their communities. With a, we're facing, as you know, you're in real estate. We're facing a population issue in our city. Yep. Population is 
you know, we're we having to build up. So all, a lot of these people are, are, are going to need a service. And the good thing about these condominiums or these townhouse complexes going up is they're de designing fitness clubs. It's a staple now. It's coming with your condominiums got a gym in it. Some of them have two. And that's to show that clearly the, the industry of health and fitness when it comes to the service is, is growing. Personal trainers come into condominiums. This is very common. Mm -hmm. uh, people hire these trainers privately. They come in and they service people in these condominiums in a private setting. And um, that's really the, 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 the route it's going. And only to go even more further into the future, that's what I see. I also see a lot of personal trainers doing nothing but children's programs. Your child is in between the ages of 8 and 14. And that's all we work with, let's say, in a particular facility or a particular environment. That's something that's also very new. And that's also the way of the future as well. Advanced age, uh, 65 plus. A lot of these people who have retired, at one time, trainers wouldn't, wouldn't really work with these people. Now what's happening is I'm part of the Friuli Center here, which is a retirement home. And uh, I see a lot of these people coming down. They're comfortable. They meet you. They talk with you. They have arthritic issues, little things. It's not about, you know, doing heavy weights. It's about what this individual needs at a stage of life that they're at to be mobile, functional, and healthy. And this is the direction I see this thing going in the future. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the goals of fitness training and, and why people are doing them. So you've, you've been told that... You know, oh, I want to look a certain way because, you know, this celebrity looks that like that or that bodybuilder looks like that. So what's 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 important? Is it important, more important to, you know, to go after what that celebrity looks like? Or is there some sort of realistic expectation people should have when they go into a gym and start training? That's the other the other uh, part of this, this thing as well. Because we're living in these in these times of, of social media, television and, and a lot of a lot of hype. We sometimes don't have a practical perspective when it comes to what our particular needs, requirements are. When we look at a celebrity, um, for example, you know, Britney Spears just did a bathing suit shoot on, a, you know, shoot she did something on a beach. A picture was taken, and people, when these celebrities post these pictures on Instagram and and Facebook and all the other social media outlets out there, they're doing it for a reason. They got a CD coming out. Each time we talk about these people and we buy these, they're making a lot of money. So sometimes what happens is Kim Kardashian will do a shot and, you know, just sometimes there's a promotional financial basis behind these things. And we, the consumer or the people looking at these individuals are like, wow, you know, so let's just alone for the movie, the Rocky series, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's no secret. He, he goes from one extreme to the next and he admitted um, what happened was he was doing, uh, I think it was Balboa. Um, people can check this on Google. And what happened was that he was in Australia and his plane, his private jet that he was flying in, uh, filming this movie there, apparently was was searched. And they um, they found steroids on, on, on the growth hormone mm -hmm. uh, on, on the plane. And he said it's his. And um, the laws are different in that, in that part of the land. And there was no legal ramifications. But we don't see that part. We don't see, you know, the extreme... Um, conditions some of these people go through. So no, it's not practical. Um, these people don't have full-time jobs. They're getting paid to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. Millions and millions and millions of dollars that we could never imagine. Mm -hmm. So when we say you want that look, it's a great goal and it's a great motivator. But realistically speaking, we have nine to five jobs, families. We cannot live that lifestyle. We don't have the financial resource. They have, you know, chefs and their blood's being tested on a daily basis and all these things and they're being monitored that's why these actors and actresses after they've done these tours they go on a tour they've lost 30 pounds look at how great she looks up on stage well three months later it's not that way anymore her look has changed because she's no longer dieting she's no longer doing the extremes and even celebrities as good as they look are human it's no secret we see them all the time a lot of difference from what he saw a few months ago and that's the reality. So the goal here is to find what your needs are as an individual and cater to those needs. It's great to have a celebrity perspective. It's a great motivator. Even the biggest loser, 80%, I think it's 85% of the people on that show have gained the weight back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. I think it's 90%. This is, a, this is a fact. And once again, if anybody wants to further their, their knowledge, Google. Biggest loser, um, where are they today? Yeah. So even... 
even and that's a celebrity based situation these are average people who become celebrities based on what we see them losing this weight we're watching them we're a part of them we're emotional we think we know them well they're in a particular environment they're not at home anymore they're being given certain foods they're being blood tested on a regular basis and it's a contract they've agreed upon that they have to stick to if they want to fulfill this particular agreement they've got with the broadcasting team for this particular show. And all these weight loss shows are the same. Top trainer, you name it. It's, it's, it's money-based and it's not practical. It's very motivating. If they've made one person get up and go do something, that's fantastic. And that, I think, is really what it should come down to. But we have to also realize these people are segregated. They're taken out of the environment. And um, the good thing about it is a lot of the people from The Biggest Loser have been posting openly on social media what they went through to lose the weight and what's happened to them since. And often that gets you into a place of realization that this is not really the way it is. So always focus on your goals. Sit down with a professional, instructor, wellness coach, and find out what your needs are and, and go that route. People can do extremely good things when the mind is there, but we do have to look at it realistically as well. Not to mention these, you know, going back to the celebrities, I mean, not only do they have the money and resources to do what they have to do, but let's face it, I mean, a lot of these photos are photoshopped and, and, and adjusted to make them look their absolute best before they even get posted anyway. I mean, a lot, they're just not real. I, I don't believe that's that right. most of them are. So, so people should, you know, really be, be wary of that and just realize that they're not, it's not real. Even these reality shows are not real. I mean, <laughs> nothing is real. It isn't. It isn't. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a secret with you. As you know, I'm, a, I'm an active athlete, an active competitor, uh, have been most of my life. Now, I've done a lot of photo shoots. Mm-hmm. And there's been times where I've done photo shoots and they want to airbrush or change maybe my skin, my skin tone or lighter tone or maybe give me an extra set of abdominals that aren't there um, in the past. And I, and I refuse to do these, these, these shoots. I refuse to take part in, in uh, falsification out there. And I was told by the gentleman hey, Dwight, like you got to realize pretty much every magazine you see out there, there's been some Photoshop, uh, Photoshop done to it to perceive, a, to, to perceive a perception that really isn't there because we have to get this thing bought. If yeah. we see the average person, we're not going to buy that magazine, yeah. right? Even if it's an actor. So we have to be marketable. But once again, it's deception. And that's why I say to people, you have to be realistic and, and go through what your, what your goals are. And um, remember that Often what we see is, is market-based. Yeah. So let's talk about the actual personal training uh, factor of it. So there's obviously what's called, you know, group classes and personal one-on-one training. Um, I've been, I've had personal one-on-one training with you. And I know that uh, if you want to learn something, dedication is, is, is the best way to do it. But maybe for some people, group classes can work. Maybe you can talk about that and, and tell us what the difference is and what the benefits are. Most definitely. Some individuals work better when it comes to a group environment in a sense of where we always feel more comfortable or stronger in numbers. And there are individuals out there who need this type of support for them to feel confident and for them to feel you know, that they're not really being focused on as an individual. Where personal training is simply, it's about you as an individual. Mm-hmm. Once again, it's also a cost factor. Um, the cost for personal training and the cost for a group class, boot camp, for example, differ dramatically. Uh, so sometimes it's a matter of, of finance. Personal training will definitely give you the best results at the end of the day because it's specific to your needs and it's specific to your time. You set a time to see the trainer and you work with that schedule accordingly. This instructor takes care of all your needs from your workout needs, if they've got a background in nutrition, they'll do all that as well. Well, in a group class, you don't necessarily will not get anything nutrition related brought to you, which is important. You may not be asked, do you have any injuries? Um, you may not be asked, what's your time like? And the worst part about it is, uh, if a group class begins at, let's say, seven o'clock, and you get there at 7.20, the class is going to go on without you. With personal training, you can maybe let the trainer know I'm running behind schedule, and they can sometimes delay some time and work with that to get you there. So it's much more of a catered to service in that regards. Two-on-ones are the same thing. Once again, two people coming in, uh, sharing the cost for the trainer makes it more cost efficient, and therefore people can actually put more time in when it comes to the service. If you're not consistent, 
with your training and, and your overall dietary intake, what's consistent means. If you're an individual that needs to be training four times a week and you can only do two times a week, then you may have to revamp what your goals are until you're able to do so because we're all very different. If you're an individual that works nights and mornings are best for you, then you may have to find a trainer that can do mornings. But sometimes the hardest part is, in my industry, a lot of people don't really personal train first thing in the morning because most people have to go to work. Hmm. So, And group classes are usually in the afternoon after five. So if you can't make it in the afternoons, but mornings are good and you want a group class, then it'll be hard to find that. With personal training, you may have a better, a better option there, more luck in that regards to. When the group class is finished, everybody walks away and often that group class is the same class each time you go back in there. It's the same, you go there, you go there, you go there, you don't touch it. There's not really much diversity. Some do change it, mm -hmm. but a lot of the times it's the same old, same old. If you want the results that are consistently gonna be coming your way, you've gotta also be doing different things to get there. Personal training is all about that. Personal training will always be changing based on what your needs are. Where a group class caters to the majority and whatever your goals are, you know, hopefully you get something out of it. So one is definitely more geared towards specific results and one is more geared more towards the general fitness activity. In other words, I tell people when it comes to group classes, um, be happy that you're getting active, be happy that you're in a fun environment, and be happy that you're doing something for your health. As far as weight loss and inches and all that stuff goes, that's secondary. You may or may not see that in a group setting. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously a lot of these uh, big box uh, fitness centers have a lot of these group trainings, uh, you know, these classes all day long where they have like 20, 30 people doing whatever a step class or Zumba class or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you have the studios like yourself that obviously you don't have these types of big classes. Um, what is like the difference between those two environments and in, in, in your experience as far as like the studio versus like the big box Mm -hmm. The big box gyms have been around for, for many years. They're the ones that pretty much dictate how things were going to be going forward, going back 20, 30 years now. It really all began there. Um, Vic Tanny's is, a, I think, was a really the first franchise gym I can remember. And then they, they were bought up by Super Fitness and, and, and they were bought up by, by Bally's and, and so on. So the big box gyms are definitely more geared towards profit. They're more geared towards numbers. That's why you see some of these gyms now, $10 a month. Hmm. How can you survive any business in Toronto, Ontario, the most expensive province in North America? You know you sell houses. Yep. <laughs> but yet they're charging you $10 a month to go to this facility. So clearly, it's a matter, a matter of volume. Yeah. It's not a matter of, of specific. Smaller Facilities like myself, studio settings, are not looking at volume because we're too tiny for that. We're looking at service quality. Mm -hmm. So you get the different quality coming into a smaller environment. Also, the big box gyms will have a class of 30 people, not uncommon, 25 people, 38 people, all in a room. There's no way one instructor can cater to all these people and help them all. So there's just no way. There's no. There's not enough time because they're limited to the time. Big box gyms you got a time limit you got to go by. With studios, we can manipulate time. Also, our group classes will never be 20 people, maybe 10 people. And with 10 people, in my group class, we have 14 to 16 people, two instructors. So each instructor has roughly eight, five, whatever the, the class number may be. And this allows for a better focus on the individuals. Some are more geared towards weight loss. So. The ones who want more weight loss would go with the instructor in the class that's going to be doing that part of the program. And then we'd flip it. So I'd do the toning aspect of it. So we, we give diversity. Where the biggest box gyms, you're never going to get that. One instructor, go, 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 45 minutes to an hour. See you guys tomorrow. We'll do it again. And there's no connection. And that people connection is what many want nowadays. We're realizing that unless we had that communication and that comfort zone, it's really hard to uh, to be productive. And those who've done both are realizing smaller environment, you know what, especially the 40 plus crowd, it's for me. Younger crowd, not there yet. That's more their thing maybe. Flashy dashy, bigger club. But those individuals who want the intimate, I've been there, done that, um, 
want a smaller environment because the results really are that, that much better. It's more catered to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, I mean, there's also the question of, and we've seen so many gyms fold, fold, and you know they they, they go under, and people buy these yearly memberships. Like, uh, is it better to buy a yearly membership or uh, go month by month, or like, uh, what what's your take on this? Especially, I mean, maybe like I can't see like one of these some of these big box ones not closing down. I can't see them closing down uh, because they're big box stores, but you never know today, right? Like we already heard uh, some, something in the news the other, uh, I think it was like a few weeks ago that you brought it up saying that, uh, you know, the manager was pocketing all this money and stuff, but uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention their name or not. But anyway, um, the, the point is, is that, I mean, is it better to get a yearly membership or just go by month by month and be careful? I'm very, I'm very against yearly memberships. I'm very against contracts. You're selling me a home. I can see why the bank wants me to agree upon some kind of a contract. It's a life. This is a, a big journey, a big venture. Sure. You know, um, you're buying a car. I can see why there has to be a contract or even insurance. There has to be a contract because this is something that's a necessity. Working out is also a necessity, but it's a necessity that you dictate. So when you're signing up for a one-year membership at a fitness facility and you're committing to a 12-month term, the, the, the gym is going to go into your account and withdraw monies every time. No, 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 no. Three months, six months, give the client, the prospective member, the option. If uh, any club wants you to, to mandatory take one year, there has to be a reason for that. Why are, not, why are there not smaller terms available at a lot of these clubs? The reason being is they want to lock you in have complete uh, access to your finance when it comes to withdrawing from your account. A lot of times there's been billing issues where people have been billed twice in one month. This is not uncommon. People have left the gym, they're no longer a member, they're still getting billed. Oh, you know, you go contact the gym, hey, why are you guys still billing me? You have to put it in writing 30 days prior to your, to your membership expiring and get the letter to head office for this to discontinue or we're going to keep billing you. Read your contract. Now, we're in the people service industry, okay? And I understand you want to make a profit, but if you're going to take away from the individual who's trying to be honest, then that hurts the whole industry. Yeah. So I'm very against the one-year memberships, unless you want to go for that. But like you said, gym's full. Things happen. Yeah. So why not take a six-month without any penalty and pay up front for that? I, I asked for that here. Um, I do have a one year here, but I also have a three month and I have a six month. And if I told you that 90%, and it's a, this is a fair number, it's probably even a bit low, 90% of the clientele who come in here, you should buy six months. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's, it's comfortable. Um, they pay up front for it. There's no contract. You come and go as you please. And we, and we go from there. I don't go into bank accounts and, and make withdrawals with, with what I do here. I'm not a believer in that. It also gives you this trust factor with the client. At, it, at the end of the day, I think the only ones who should be able to get into your into your bank account, Robert, are banks if they need to for your mortgage, and of course um, insurance. Other than that, nobody else should have access to your finance, and this is my belief. Okay, so Dwight, let's let's talk about uh, you know uh, times when people should be coming in to work out, like you know their sessions and you know price, how long, like what's what's a good sort of like time frame and, and price and for for how long somebody should be training. For the beginner coming in and starting up, and they've been inactive for let's say a year or more, this individual, whatever the goals are, this individual would probably want to start personal training twice a week to three times a week to get them readapted or readjusted into a workout regime. Once again, their lifestyle and their commitments outside of the fitness center will dramatically affect this consistency. But for somebody trying to be productive or result oriented I suggest three times a week for the beginner. If the person is already active and they want to up their level of fitness, personal training four times a week, three times a week is fantastic. Some say, but I can't afford that. It's so much money. That's fine. If you're a member of the gym, maybe you can have your personal trainer do a program for you, and then you can see your trainer around twice a week. So instead of seeing him twice a week or her twice a week, you're coming in on a program that's specific to the, the goals you want to acquire. Today, you work back on your own. When you see me tomorrow, we'll work chest or we'll work legs. This is a way you can complement the workouts. The following week, 
here's your chest workout, and we'll do the other body parts. So we'll flip it around. And that way you're able to monitor your clients as far as where they are on their independent workout and, and also with you. Um, fees and times. At Bodies to Envy, we don't do your standard one-hour sessions here. Reason being is between water breaks, um, sometimes people are coming in, they're a bit tired, they're behind schedule. I give all sessions here an hour and a half. An hour and a half is what the session is. I say to people, if you're paying the money that, are, that trainers are asking for, for one hour or 45 minutes, it's not benefiting you because things are going to happen and you may need more time. Some people are more efficient. They're very fast in their workout. They can get through an hour, no problem. Fantastic. Others need more time. So I suggest an hour and a half. It may not take you that long to get through your workout, but at least you know you don't have to watch the clock. You've got that time to get it done, and you can rest assured that the trainer has your best interest. Fees. Big box gyms roughly are looking at $80 a class, and that's for 30 classes or more. Wow. Generally speaking, the more classes you purchase, the less you would pay. So if you buy 100 classes, you may pay $70. If you buy 60 classes, you, pay, you, you might pay 90. It's a lot of money. Um, and once again, these personal training classes, and I'm referring to the big box gyms at this time, once again, we'll have you swipe a credit card or they'll make you do monthly installments or whatever the case may be. And I'm very against that because once again, once you commit, you're now under contract. At the smaller club here, we pretty much start our rate at about 60 to $70. And that's for 20 classes, mm -hmm. not the 30 or 40 or 50 that we see at some of these other places. Um, and we actually go down to as low as, as 10 or 12 classes. Um, once again, our top end being a $67 class. So if you're buying 12 classes, it may cost you $70 or $65. If you're already a member at the facility, we're not going to charge you that. We're charging you a lot less. You shouldn't have to pay for a membership and then pay premium price for a personal training session too. So it's not right because we value your business and because you're already a member here, we're going to give you a dramatic reduction. Usually I give 30% reduction if you're a member at the gym. Mind you, some come in and they want to personal train and I will give a membership complimentary to the individual. But nobody here pays for two. And I strongly uh, i am against anybody going anywhere, paying a membership and paying for personal training. You know, if you think about it, it doesn't really make any sense. To me, mm -hmm. that's like paying to go into a restaurant and then paying to eat there. <laughs> It's like uh, the cover charge at a bar, and, and then you have to pay to. But anyway, that's yeah. a whole different story. <laughs> you should. So, so that's that's the problem with with the industry right now. Luckily, a lot of smaller clubs are opening up that are are giving people better user friendly fees and services, and that's good to see that. But eventually, the big box gyms are going to have to um, migrate as well into the same system. I think. Yeah. Let's uh, move into supplementation. So. Um, we, we've talked about supplementation before, but uh, maybe you can touch on it again. So when it comes to supplementation in personal training, like what's what's a good sort of mix or what, what's important about supplementation? Maybe what are the best supplements to take? And not only that, I mean, medication is a big key factor because well, there's a lot of people taking medication as well. And obviously that has to take a toll on the body, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yes. When taking medication, the best approach to take is to always speak with a wellness coach or nutritionist. They can take a look at the medication you're, you're taking and find the best combination for you to use supplementation-wise to help you acquire the goals that you that you want to need that you want to need the goals that you actually need. So that's what we call special population. Special population need to be assessed before supplementation is introduced. Some can use B vitamins. Some can use vitamin D. It really depends on the medication and the time of day you're taking it. So people, if you're medicated and you want to maybe look into, into supplementation to aid you with their results, great idea. But definitely speak with an individual who has the knowledge and the background that can direct you on what is best for you based on the goals that you want to acquire and the medication you're, you're actually currently on as well. Your eating is going to also be a factor. So these three things are all looked at before you're given the direction to go in the supplementation. The general population that want to supplement, once again, 
my big thing is B vitamins. You can't go wrong with B vitamins, especially when it comes to increasing the way we metabolize. B vitamins are fantastic. Some people can't take B vitamins. Um, there's different sources. Well, look at the sources. You have the plant life and you have the sea life. And the sea life, some people have an allergy to shellfish and they cannot use the sea life form of, of B vitamins, let's say. Um, although it's a better source, it's a higher biogradable source, they still can't use it because it's a reaction there. So they may have to go to the vegetable source. It simply means they got to ingest a lot more of the vegetable source than they would of the sea source because one is just not as bioavailable as the other when it comes to consumption. So definitely your B vitamins. I'm very big on protein shakes. Protein shakes. There's so many out there. I mean, they're even at Walmart. <laughs> so you can buy them anywhere. Um, this is another area that I, I, I strongly recommend you speak to a professional. When I say professional, I don't mean the person working for the store because they're going to sell you what's on sale and what's going to give them the best return when it comes to their profit. Speak to an individual that is totally unbiased and is looking at your best interest. One is close, nutritionist, personal trainer with a background in, in nutrition. We will recommend what we feel is a better source because some people can't take dairy-based products. Mm -hmm. They just don't know that. Yeah. So they have to go veggie-based. Uh, so these are the things that we want to make sure that we're aware of before we jump into that, that end of the water. A uh, multivitamin. We need a multivitamin. We all need a multivitamin. As good as I am with my eating and my dietary intake, a multivitamin is essential because we're not getting the, the sources that we need from our foods. So definitely a multivitamin with, with all your nutrients. So a high multivitamin, I highly recommend. Once again, I'm speaking about the special population, not uh, speaking about general population, not special population. Um, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin C. These are all the top ones. So our B vitamins, our C, our Ds, our Es. Don't miss those. Even if you aren't exercising and you're considering it, try to make sure that we're at least taking enough nutrient into our system. A lot of people are like, I don't work out, so I'm not going to take that stuff because it's, I'm not working out. No. These are essentials that we need. So whether you're working out or not, doesn't change the fact that we need these essentials. When you go to the bathroom, when you sweat, we're losing all these minerals and vitamins, working out or not. So we have to obviously punish them. And often people out there walking around, I'm so tired, I'm beaten up. It's because they're usually lacking nutrients and they aren't even going to a gym. It's just a matter of the fact that they're lacking nutrient. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest getting on these multis and getting a, a good B vitamin. Um, and, 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 and what happens is you actually begin to eat a bit better because as we begin one, everything else will follow. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about rest and recovery. Now you've, you've said that everybody's different or, you know, obviously people's goals are different as to how many times they should be in the gym. Uh, what about rest and recovery? Because that's, I, I, as far as I know, it's the most important part of working out because if you're not resting those muscles, you're not doing anything. Right. So that's right. That's right. We lose weights. We build muscle when we are sleeping. Wow, I had a really good workout. I must have burned like 3,000 calories. I hear it all the time. Yeah. Maybe you did, but unless you get that eight hours, maybe six, which is minimal, it should be at least eight hours rest, all that work in the gym means nothing. You get up in the morning, we feel lighter. I feel so flat. Well, guess what? During your rest, things are metabolizing. Things are fusing. Things are happening internally. That's when we lose weight and build muscle in our sleep, believe it or not. So the activity we do before that is a precursor to what's to happen that night. So if we're not getting sufficient rest, we just cannot possibly expect to get the results as efficiently or keep them as well as we think we're going to. For example, it's not uncommon to see somebody come into a fitness club and this person fast tracks. The results are like, wow, look how quickly that he or she is lost, he's toned healthier, looking good, feeling better. Well, that person's probably getting really good rest, odds are, and that person's probably taking the nutrient they need to get into their system. All these multivitamins and minerals and stuff that I was talking about earlier, that really all takes place in our, in our rest. That's when it does its work. So if we're working midnight, which many people do, and we're sleeping four hours in the day or five hours in the day, the odds are we're not benefiting nothing near what we should because you're right, the most important factor is sleep. Unless you're getting that eight hours, I suggest none of us get that, but eight hours is really what I recommend to really see great results 
and you'll actually feel a lot better because your body's getting up just recovered. That's the word. And that's what we want to see things change. So if somebody's um, working out too much, oh, well, obviously there is too much. You can, if you're not getting enough rest, that means you're overworking the body and you, you might not, you, you're not losing the weight or you're not gaining the muscle or you're not getting your results that you want. How do we know what the right balance is? Once again, because a lot of people aren't savvy in that area, you want to always have a resource you can go to to make sure you're doing things the right way. Uh, indications of this are you're getting up tired, you're getting up feeling drowsy, you're getting up feeling demotivated. Um, you go to the gym, you don't have the energy, you don't want to be there. Um, your numbers are going up on the scale, not down. Your dress size is going up, not down. Um, mind you, sometimes it's it's hormonal based, sometimes it's you know dietary based. Um, but a lot of the times it's just the, the balance is off. And in order to find that balance between your rest and your and your eating and, and uh, your exercise, you need someone to sort of sit down with and, and let you know. Like I ask all the time, like, how are you feeling? Um, and so on. And you also sometimes feel old injuries will reoccur for no reason. Um, even sometimes your mood may be a little bit off. You don't feel, you know, as good. You're more edgy. These are all indications of, of lack of rest. These are all signs of lack of rest, I should say. And you don't always know, but talk to a professional. I talk to professionals for everything. My car, that chair, you know, because I need to know exactly what is what. Always get advice from a professional to make sure that things are in order because you just don't always know. Good, good. So what, one last question before we, uh, before we finish off here. So uh, vacations. People take vacations. They go away. You got the all you can eat buffet, which uh, I love. <laughs> but so what about exercising on vacations? Because I, I see so many, I mean, I've been away a lot of times and they have these beautiful gyms there. I mean, what should we do as a balance? I mean, obviously stay away from the buffet or eat less if you can, but uh, what should we do as far as exercising? If you're somebody that works out, say, three days a week and now you go to you go on vacation, should you continue that three days or, or try to continue that three days? Well, let's say your vacation is a seven-day seven vacation. The day of travel, I wouldn't exercise. You're in the air, there's luggage, there's, so I wouldn't travel. So you've lost one day right there. And the day you leave is also a day of loss. So out of the seven days of vacation, two of those days are literally based on travel, mm -hmm. especially if you're flying away. So you have five days theoretically to work with. Out of those five days, I would say pick two days to exercise. So... If you could do three, fantastic. But because you want to de-stress and enjoy your time, I say try to get in out of five days, two. If you can do three, all the better. Eating is fine. Enjoy the buffet and do your thing. It's time to unwind and relax. But a bit of activity, you will find, will keep your energy levels up. You'll be a lot more conscious at the buffet. That's for sure. Um, and you actually have a more enjoyable vacation because you're not lounging on the beach. People who lounge on the beach and the drinks and the food are going back, when they get back from that vacation, it takes them many weeks to get back on track because they've just let go. So true. So a bit of activity, an hour. I say make it an hour. Make it an hour of exercise, time it. Just do an hour and see how you feel. And you'll come back from that vacation feeling vibrant, ready to go back to work, and the word is rested because that little bit of exercise will keep things metabolizing and you'll not feel sluggish. So I'm definitely all about that. If I'm going to be gone for six days or five days, I try to do three if I can. Sometimes two, but at least, at least, uh, at least I get that in. And you will feel better. If you've never done it, people, on your next vacation, just try that and, and see how you feel during and after your trip, how you feel. So, Dwight, you've uh, mentioned to me uh, – something that I've never, ever, ever heard of. It's called adipose fat. I have no idea what that is. And it's apparently it's extremely important. So please share, share uh, with our viewers why this is important. The problem with our society that we're living in now is we always talk about body fat as it's just one particular thing, when really it's not. We have two types of fats as animals. We have a brown fat, and we have a, a, a white fat, and they're, and they're both adipose, more or less, uh, base in a sense. The thing about the adipose in particular is 
over the over the, the regular fat is adipose fat is what is housed around our organs and right underneath our skin. Um, this protects our organs, so it's actually an essential fat that's needed. But like any fat, we can also have too much of it. And often what happens is when people are talking about losing weight loss, they don't realize that the adipose fat, which is housing our organs, is, is usually very high. Um, you can get this checked by blood tests. You can speak to your physician about it, your doctor can find out how high your levels are when it comes to this. But in general, when we're looking at fat weight on the scale or in an assessment diagnostic setting, um, we have to account that adipose fat is an essential that we need. And although it is manipulated through dietary and exercise, it's still, it's still an essential fat. And women actually carry more adipose fat than men do. Once again, it's housed around organs where women have ovaries. So often it's like, well, do I look at my, well, sometimes your adipose fat in that region is so predominant that that little, what do they call it, a paunch, they want to call it, some of the girls have been saying to me, they call it, sometimes it's simply, it's simply based on that. And you can train as, long, as much as you want, but genetically speaking, that's just the way your body is uh, when it comes to being inclined with, with adipose tissue. Um, uh, years ago, there used to be a, a fat burner called um, adipose. It was something called adipose. And it was like, well, this is going to burn adipose. No, it, it can't. Adipose tissue can only be affected, once again, through nutrition and, and through dietary exercise. Uh, nutrition and dietary exercise. And once again, you can only really get your adipose tissue too low. Once it gets to a particular level of unhealthiness, then we're in trouble. So people, when you're looking at body fat, remember, the adipose fat, the fat we don't want to really manipulate too much, is insulates us from the cold, protects us in the heat, and protects the organs when it comes to, uh, to damage, you take a fall, and so on. So always remember that there's usually a few other things happening internally, why our bodies are the way they are. Um, some people have a lot more adipose tissue than others do, it's genetic based, but once again, you can reduce it to see numbers manipulate, but it's also an essential fat that we all need. So definitely take a, a look into it if you want to find out more about it, people. Just simply search adipose fat, and uh, you realize, wow, I had no idea we even had this in us. And yeah, that's the battle. So we're battling two, not one. Okay. Can I ask you quickly, though, like if you have, so you have fat on your arms and your legs or whatever, that's not adipose fat. And if you were to lose that excess of fat, because I understand that when you when you lose weight, you don't just lose weight in one section of your body, you're losing weight every single part of your body at the same time, at the sort of same rate. So if you have excessive fat, let's say on your legs or you know on your in your stomach or whatever, and if you lose that fat, are you also reducing the amount of adipose fat that you're losing at the same time? Exactly. You it is okay. a fact. Yes. And the thing about it too, some people are just once again, you know, genetically speaking, house uh, body fat in certain areas compared to others. And often it's 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 adipose based, brown fat based as well. So if you reduce one, you often will reduce the other. And this is a great thing. Oh, that's very interesting. I think people definitely need to learn more about it and uh, seek yeah. uh, some more professional help on it and obviously your guidance on how to reduce it. Exactly, exactly. And adipose fat is also a fat that is stubborn. So to break that adipose tissue is very hard to because of where it's located. Um, surface fat is one thing, but internal fat is something else. So it's the hardest uh, fat to tackle when it comes to manipulation. I know for me, my adipose tissue is very low. You know, I'm wearing a jacket. It's like 20 degrees in here. So, <laughs> I mean, so, but that's, that's okay because um, I know what's going on. And um, it's just been all these years of training and my, and my uh, organ fat is very low. But at least I know that. And I'm trying to get it up. But uh, it's not that easy because it's been years of, of, um, of reduction. And this is the thing. And sometimes people who are very skinny, very slim, uh, runners, I'll use them as an example, have very low adipose tissue levels. But they're also very sickly. A lot of things happen. And, and we don't want that either. So there's a balance we should always maintain there. Dwight, it's uh, as always, it's been a true pleasure to have you on and get all that beautiful knowledge out of your brain <laughs> always happy to be here very happy I look forward this is my look forward today let's say <laughs> sure. and people look forward to listening to what you have to say and, I, and uh, i'm sure the listeners appreciate uh your knowledge and your advice and as always they can come directly to you 
Uh, we'll have your website posted. It's bodies envycom Go visit his site and uh, check it out. And you, there's a lot of new information there because you've updated the website. And uh, by all means, give Dwight a call and get get the information you need directly from him. So thanks, uh, thanks for coming, Dwight. Yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm more happy to be here. I also have to also say this as well um, to people out there who are listening. I'm here to help. My goal is to help as many people as possible. Um, I don't charge fees for consultations. People are worried about, oh my goodness, what's he going to charge? No, no. Drop me an email. Uh, I'm also on, on, on Facebook under Bodies to Envy. I'm out there. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to promote a healthy environment. I'm trying to promote there's, there's, there's options. I'm trying to promote there's health. And um, feel free to, to contact me at any point in time. Um, there's not going to be a charge. I'll gladly answer all your questions. If you've got a family member or anybody that needs help, definitely do so because we're all learning from each other. And um, if I can pass on some info that's going to help you or your loved ones, I'm more than happy to do so. Thank you for having me, Rob. Well, thank you, and we will see you again next month. Thank you. Thanks.